Um. <laughs> so uh, this is a brief overview of span of T and read on the human memory of read on the memory T. Um, it's brief and high level because this is all very involved memory stuff that I only pretend to know. So uh, feel free to ask questions or correct me. Um, there was a question about uh, this fellow here. I did not draw this. This is the official, unofficial logo of Span of T. This is Spanity the Manatee. Um, <laughs> so when types are in the core framework labs, they tend to get uh, sort of cult following, so they get logos created. And this was the logo, but it apparently had to get dropped when it, uh, when it moved into the real thing. And I tried to find, there was also a video of um, Jared Parsons doing an introduction to memory of T and the automated transcription every time he said memory of T with his slight little accent, it said manatee. And I tried to find a screenshot, but they fixed the transcription, so I couldn't. So. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so what is span of T? So span of T uh, is a new value type at the heart of .NET that enables representation of contiguous regions of arbitrary memory, which is very easy to follow and understand, but I'll explain it anyway. Uh, so it's a new value type. Uh, value type, so it's a struct. Um, that's what value type means. Um, it's available on NuGet. And you can try it now. It's in system.memory. Um, it is new in that it's not even released yet. So it's still at RC1 as of yesterday when I checked. Um, but quirkily enough, it's uh, .NET standard 1.0 DLL, which means it can be used on sort of everything, like .NET 4.5 and above, Mono, .NET Core, obviously. So it's kind of supports all these older stuff, but then it's also kind of new and kind of part of C Sharp 7.2, which hopefully I'll explain later, at least I'll attempt it. Um, so at the heart of .NET, uh, I don't know, taking some liberty with what someone else wrote here, but um, essentially it is aimed at bringing um, some of the tenets of .NET to direct memory access. So it's uh, providing memory safety, type safety, um, it allows you to do things that you can do now, but you have to use unsafe code. It allows you to do them without unsafe code. And it is aimed at being uh, high performance with no or low overhead. Um, and there's work done and the framework and the CLR and the JIT and the GC and sort of across the board to support it in various ways and make it better in various ways. But its job is to access memory. and. It's arbitrary memory, so it doesn't care what type of memory. So you can use this with p-invoke. If you get back a pointer from a, a p-invoke call, like a Win32 API call, you can use span of t to access that memory. You can use it with managed memory, which is just your normal .NET types. And you can use it with stack allocated memory, which via the stack alloc keyword, which probably didn't get a whole lot of use by most people, but maybe with span of t it will, because it's a lot safer now. To put it in simple terms, though, um, you can think of it as though you've got an array that accesses, directly accesses the memory that something is stored in. So a quick example, if we have a byte array, we've got 10 elements in our array, we can cast that to a span, it's an implicit cast, and if we set a value in the span, it sets a value in the underlying array. So there is one 10 element array, and there are two things accessing it, which is not very exciting because that's just pointers. So the other thing spans lets you do, though, is uh, take slices of memory. So if we take a slice of that span, we get another span, and we're going to start at position four, and we're going to have a slice that is three elements long. So we now have a three element uh, block of memory that is the sort of the middle three elements of that original array. So if we set the first element in our slice, that's the same as the fourth element in our previous span, which is the same as the fourth element in our previous array. Make sense? I will. I have a visual tool later. Um, and it gives us memory, uh, memory safety. So we said our slice was three bytes long. So the fifth element in it gets us an index out of range exception, even though this actually is valid in that original array. So we're not going outside the bounds of our memory that we're allowed to touch. But we said this was how big our spam was, and so .NET will keep us to that. So, yeah, visual. So this is uh, Fisher Price, my first memory. Uh, this is not real. These memory addresses normally are much longer. <laughs> Poetic license, please. Let me. Um, so let's say, for example, we are going to um, pass out a string. We've got some identifier, uh, and we want the numerical part of that standard format. 
it's my card, don't be creepy. Um, <laughs> so what happens when we declare our variable called plate, or you know, it's passed in as a parameter, whatever it is, we have a string called plate, is uh, a, a spot in memory gets allocated on the stack for plate, and it points to memory position one, and then on the heap we get our string, which is YGG871. And then we want to take a substring of that string so we can get the numeric part. <coughs> and so we've reassigned plate, so plate now points to memory addition, memory spot number two, and 871 goes in memory spot number two. <coughs> so right here, what we have done is, as you can see, nothing points to this spot of memory. So we have now got something in the heap that will need to be garbage collected. So this is an allocation and people who write a high performance code or code that doesn't use much RAM, they like to avoid allocations. This is why. This string is just sitting there, no one's using it. And then we can parse that int and that gets stored on the stack because an int is a value type. So this is fairly straightforward. You know, I mean, we haven't wasted a lot of memory in the grand scheme of things because this is a pretty trivial example. But this is the type of thing that span of t allows you to avoid is this extra wasted memory. And then the other thing is the extra wasted CPU cycles of the garbage collector having to actually go through and clean that up. Because when the garbage collector is running, none of your code is running. It has to pause. That, depending on your software, can take time. So with span, what this becomes, so we still get our original plate variable on the, on the heap. And again, this could be a parameter or something. If we cast that as a span, or call the as span extension method in the case of a string. Uh, so first thing to note is we get back a read-only span. That's because strings are immutable. Fair enough. So you can't access, you, you can't write to the memory that a string is stored in, but you can read it. And a span looks like this. It has, uh, well, in .NET 4.5, it has a pointer to the spot in memory where it's looking at. It has an offset, which is the current offset in memory that's looking at, and it has a length. So we're pointing to memory address one, we're at the start, and the six things for us to play with. So instead of a substring, if we now do a slice, what happens is this offset changes to three. That's it. So instead of a substring which creates another string, occupies some more memory, has to copy some stuff around, all this does is set one field on the stack, job done. So it's got to be a lot faster, and it's not wasting any memory. Um, it's not using up any extra memory. And then with improvements to the framework, we can still just call int.parse because Microsoft would be nice enough to add in lots of overloads that we can directly access uh, spans. So that gets stored in the stack. So the same code uses less memory, or less, has less allocations, and will run faster because there's less work for it to do. Again, trivial example, but hopefully you get the point. So this is the slow span. Uh, the reason it's called a slow span is because span has three fields in .NET Core, They've done some extra work to make it, um, I think the JIT, it's a JIT intrinsic. Um, but anyway, it has two fields. Uh, and it does some magic where the pointer stores the pointer to the offset in memory, but the garbage collector is smart enough to know how to move that around if it has to move this spot in memory around. Any questions so far after your visual treat? Cool. I'm assuming you're all with me. So. Uh, Slow and fast span, uh, those terms are relative. They're both pretty quick, uh, but depends on what you're doing. So in, in .NET 4.6 and .NET Core 1.1, that's the slow span, so 0 0.6 nanoseconds. Uh, .NET Core 2, 0.5 nanoseconds. So personally speaking, for the software I wrote, all right, doesn't matter. But someone probably does. Well, I know it does. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Uh, the main performance difference, though, is substring versus slice. So not including allocating the original string and where that might have come from. The, the big differences here is obviously slice is allocating zero bytes of memory. So that's less work because it doesn't have to allocate it, less work for the GC because it doesn't have to clean it up. Uh, the speed is ridiculously faster, as you can see. Um, and the cool thing is if you look at slice for 10, uh, 10 character long string or 1,000, it's linear time basically because all it's doing is moving that offset. It doesn't matter how long the string is, it's not really doing anything different. Um, so huge speed ups around the sort of real world code. So as I said, they're Microsoft being nice to us and they're adding in lots of support in the framework for um, this sort of thing. So this is the int32 class. Um, this is in .NET Core 2.1. 
that they're doing this in. Um, and there's just heaps of pull requests around going through sort of if there's ever a parse or a tripars tri or a format or a triformat, um, and even internally in inside the framework itself, if there's bits of the framework that use um, that use substring, change them to use slice to so get everything faster. And, and the benchmarks of .NET Core 2.0 versus .NET Core 2.1 are incredibly fast, not only because of span, but I'm sure it helps. Um, so Microsoft are doing a whole bunch to allow this to be used you know, everywhere. They're also adding in some new capabilities that are interesting. So let's say we wanted to create a, uh, an ID, a, a, a string of you know, random numbers. <coughs> this is sort of one of the ways you could do it now. So allocate the array, loop through filling it in, and in the end, convert that array to a string. Um, if you like short code, you could use link, for example. Uh, same theory, just not with a loop. Um, but essentially, you've always got to assemble your characters and then convert them to a string. So one of the cool things Span does, or they've done in the framework, is they've added a new extension method to string, uh, sorry, a static method to string, called create. And what this does is it lets you pass in a length. .NET will then pre-allocate that memory for that string of that length, and it will pass you a span that is writable that lets you write to that memory. So inside this delegate, you can write to that string's memory. After that delegate exits, you can't anymore because strings are back to being immutable. But so these sorts of interesting scenarios of directly accessing memory are now, you know, they're possible. I mean, this is possible anyway, and I, I you can write to a string's memory if you really want to, you just have to use unsafe code. So this allows you to do it safely. Um, and again, the performance benefits are pretty big. Um, so span, it's a little bit faster than a loop, which kind of makes sense because ultimately it is still looping. Um, but it's nice that it's still faster because that, you know, it's got to allocate a func, etc. Um, the allocations is where the clearest thing is. You can see it basically allocates half as much, which again makes sense because we're not allocating an array and then copying it to a string. We're just allocating one string and filling it in. So huge memory benefits. Um, for mere mortals like us, it's really good for string parsing and processing arrays, so doing something with arrays. So trivial examples here, looking for a capital letter, looking for a uh, summing an array. Um, because you can treat it like an array and it has index, uh, indexes on it and instead of substring it has slice, but it's basically the same. Uh, for these two bits anyway, if you just change those parameters to read only span, each type, this code will now be faster. And this code itself already didn't allocate, so that hasn't changed, but the calling code that called this now can avoid an allocation. So if you for example, were reading in a file and you wanted to call our contains capital letters method, you'd have to read that file in to a string so that you can pass it to this method. These methods now are more generically applicable, but they also sort of, uh, they call out more what they actually want, which is just give me some memory that is characters. Who cares what format it's in? So by thinking about, you know, that, that memory rather than the storage of it, um, it means the call of these things uh, get to improve. So it's not all good news. Uh, there are some limitations. So because these uh, the spans have to have pointers to um, the heap and to, to save the cost of having to manage that, um, they are stack-only things. So they can only live on the stack, um, which is implemented as a new concept in C Sharp 7.2 called a ref struct, which is a stack-only struct. And because, well, in order to guarantee that if you define something that's a ref struct, it can only be on the stack, you can't use it as a field in anything but another ref struct. So it's turtles all the way down. Um, so yeah, structs that can only be on the stack. Um, so these things are new in 7.2. So that system memory DLL that you can use in .NET 4.5 and you can use with the C Sharp 6 compiler, it couldn't be compiled with the C Sharp 6 compiler. Um, so because they have to be on the stack, they also have all of these limitations, like they can't implement interfaces. Um, the biggest things you probably would actually see is they can't be used in async methods, and they can't be used in uh, iterators, so yield statement things. Uh, because as part of processing that, 
well, actually, I think I have, I have an example. So for example, <laughs> if we had an ASIC method here that took in a span, um, this looks fine, but it doesn't work. I mean, the compiler doesn't let you, but it would not work at runtime. Uh, so in case you didn't know, this is kind of what the compiler does when you write an ASIC method, um, except for this line, which is cheating, because it's PowerPoint. I couldn't bother. Uh, but essentially, what the compiler has to do is it creates a class, and everything you use in your ASIC method, it stores as fields on that class, and then that class does stuff. So in the case, if this was a yield statement, then that class would implement I enumerator and have a get next method, um, a move next method. Uh, in the case of async, you know, it's got the continuation stuff. But so essentially, this span here is a field on something that is not a ref struct. So this is not allowed. Because when your async method starts to wait, all of your stack has to get hoisted off the stack and put on to the heap for later so it can be unwound. And that, that operation is not allowed on um, ref structs at span. So the solution for this is another type called memory of t. Uh, memory of t is a normal struct, plain old struct. Um, and so it doesn't have those limitations that span has, but of course, trade-offs, uh, it's not as fast as span. Um, but yeah, can be used in more places. So this example doesn't work, you can't just do this. With a memory of t, you still access a span, but this is allowed because the memory of t is a normal struct, so it can be moved around, and you're accessing the span uh, you know, only when you need it. So it's not like, it's not uh, stored on the class. It kind of looks like this. This is not real at all. Um, I don't think you can actually, you can kind of, I don't think you can represent these things in C Sharp necessarily, but um, essentially memory of T, as well as the three fields that span has, it also has a reference to the actual data that you're operating on. And so that makes it slower because the garbage collector does have to manage that. Um, but as you can see, when you want to span, it just gives you one you know, temporarily, so that has to be on the stack, and then everything works. Uh, so why? Uh, this is a screenshot from the Tech Empower benchmarks, round 14, which was last year, and round 15 was a few months ago. Um, basically, why is to make ASP.NET, and specifically .NET Core, uh, as fast as it can be. And this is, again, this is not all due to span, lots of other work going on here. Um, but essentially, um, so 1.7 million requests per second, 40% uh, meaning, uh, you know, 60% of things were better than it. Um, and then a year later, this, so this is .NET Core 1.1, I think, and this is .NET Core 2.0, I think, um, up to 80%. So this is now like in the top 20. And then uh, the current uh, testing one they've got is doing 7 million requests per second, but it's different hardware, so it's not quite comparable, but it's super fast. Um, essentially, it's to make it really fast. They want .NET Core and ASP.NET Core specifically to be uh, you know, a, as fine a choice as any other web server technology. It's cross-platform, so if they can get the speed up, here we go. Um, and there's interesting things being done, uh, so there's a a couple of people who uh, I follow on Twitter are working on something called Project Magma, which is uh, re-implementing IP, as in internet protocol, from the ground up in .NET, in C Sharp. So IP, and then they've put on TCP IP, and then on top of that. And so eventually, the entire stack of ASP.NET, in theory, will be managed code, um, which is pretty cool. And yeah, but will be fast enough. Uh, that end, any questions? Are there, do you know if there's any Roslyn analyzers that would help you use the new stuff? I don't know of any. Um, no, it is still release candidate though. Um, and yeah, pretty much, so it's .NET Core 2.1 has all the framework support. Yeah. Um, the only thing I've ever seen is that it will be coming to .NET framework in time, but I don't know what that means. Um, so there's sort of, it doesn't limit you too much. Like you can still use it in your code. Um, where it's really suited, if you've got stuff that does string parsing, as I said. So like, um, I wrote a SQL parser once, and I wrote a text templating engine, and I wish I still had that code. 
legally um, because I'd love to like swap it over to this and just see what the difference is. Um, it, it's really beneficial there. But at the end of the day, if you're not targeting .NET Core 2.1, you have to call two-string on your span and you know, you're going to lose some benefit. But um, yeah, hopefully it will roll out and, and it will be um, more prevalent uh, in future. But we just kind of have to wait. Yeah. In, in your early example, when you reassign flights, yes. before you spun, if you had spun in place at that point, would it point to the old place or the new place? Um, the old one? <laughs> I think. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I imagine the old one. I mean, reassigning a variable is kind of a, a language thing that's not really, yeah, it, it doesn't reuse the same spot in memory like I had in the stack. Um, so, yeah, I assume the old one. Um, there is some smarts there, in particular the .NET Core version. The, um, the pointer field is a ref field, which is also new. So it's a ref field on a ref struct. It's all refs. Um, and so the, that, it, it does do some magic, I think, mainly around the garbage collector. It does some magic around keeping those things um, tied together. But yeah, I assume reassignment wouldn't change that. Cool. Thank you.